God moves in a mysterious way his wonders to perform. What a wonderful hymn that William Cowper put together for us. Cowper was a British hymnist uh, back in the late 1700s. Uh, he originally trained for law, but uh, having difficulties with his mind, his mental stability, uh, he was not able to pursue that, but rather pursued a career as a poet and a hymnist. He wrote many hymns that we are familiar with. Uh, some of them uh, are, are uh, well known, like this one. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins, and sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. What beautiful language, what wonderful images of a sinner being washed by the blood of Christ. As you read through his hymns, a theme seems to come up rather frequently uh, of light, of illumination, of God's shining upon his people. Uh, in this hymn, from our hymnal, we read, Sometimes a light surprises the Christian when he, while he sings. It is the Lord who rises with healing in his wings. When comforts are declining, he grants the soul again a season of clear shining to cheer it after rain. That theme of illumination occurs throughout uh, the hymns that we have in our Trinity hymn, but we have about five of his hymns in our hymnal. I would rather wish that uh, a generation or two later, Charles Darwin would have listened to some of these hymns a little bit more closely. Uh, particularly the last verse of the hymn we just sang, which concludes with these words, Blind unbelief is sure to err and scan his work in vain. God is his own interpreter, and he will make it plain. When it comes to our evaluation of the world around us, we should see it in the light that God gives to us in his holy inspired word and interpret the world in that light and not abandon that light and simply try to go out on our own and discover for ourselves what we think the world is like. Blind unbelief is sure to err. Well, the hymns of The hymns of Charles, no, <laughs> Mr. Cowper, uh, are hymns that encourage us to rest in the Lord, to sing His praises in all of life, to see everything as subject to His leading and guidance. And it's that kind of theme that uh, the prophet Isaiah catches hold of as he uh, continues this hymn or this book of comfort for the church of the Lord, this message of the coming servant of the Lord who would bring salvation and redemption for the people of God. We've been making our way through the book of Isaiah, and beginning with the 40th chapter on through the end of the book, we have this book of comfort, which something is addressed to those who will go into exile uh, and then be in exile in Babylon for 70 years until they are finally released by the Medo-Persian Empire as Cyrus the king comes on the scene. Isaiah anticipates the coming of Cyrus by actually naming him in advance over 100, about 150 years prior to when Cyrus actually appeared. He names him, and Cyrus is in fact the one who sets uh, the people of God free from Babylon. But more Significantly, Isaiah has in mind the great work of redemption that God has for us in Jesus Christ. This exodus out of Babylon was merely a, a shadow, an anticipation of the greater exodus that Jesus Christ would provide for his people. As he delivers us from the kingdom of darkness and brings us into the kingdom of light. Jesus is the one who is that servant of the Lord. We looked at that somewhat last week when we considered how God had brought His chosen servant into the world, one in whom His soul delighted, 
And this would be the one who would bring justice to the earth by laying down his life as a sacrifice for sin, satisfying all God's just demands and making us righteous in God's sight. And he also brought light into the world. He's one who brings truth, who illumines us by his covenant. He has become a covenant to us and we are illumined by our relationship to him. And so we saw last week that in the coming of this son, we have one who uh, gives us a foundation for life, a foundation for morals on the one hand, and a foundation for truth on the other. They are rooted in Jesus Christ, the Son of God who comes into the world. All trust in idols is vain, as Isaiah would make the point. Idols cannot give you a firm foundation for truth or morals. Whether it be the idols that the, the pagans of the past hammered onto a platform and bowed down and worshipped, or whether it be the modern idols of the mind and heart, those who worship self or the state in its humanistic form as it takes on power and dominion over the earth. We are not to worship idols because they cannot provide us a clear foundation for either truth or morals. It is built on the foundation that the those things, idols, are built on the foundation that denies God's sovereign plan for all of human history and time. And it's only that sovereign plan that can give us a proper foundation to know the truth or to have a moral compass in life. If we reject God's sovereign plan and His control of all of history, as the modern man does, and commit himself to his own discovery of the world around him, his interpretation of the world is that it is basically run by chance. In the end, it all comes down to chance. And yes, we try to uh, understand it by our science and our philosophy and so forth and bring order to it, but that order, again, is like a spider web up in the air that has nothing to rest upon. It's like a cork in the sea that flows from one direction to the other, blown about, as Paul would use the imagery, from, from the seas, the waves of the sea, from one position to the next. And when you look at the progress of human thought and history over time, philosophy in particular, it moves from one end to the other. One philosopher is contradicted by his very student. Plato is denied by Aristotle, and it goes on and on and on because there is no clear foundation. The only foundation is found in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who created the heavens and the earth and orders all things, who brings us a clear foundation for truth and morals. Because he is the infinitely wise and eternal God, who speaks with authority as our Creator, and before him we are accountable. And at heart, everyone knows that. They deny it, they suppress it, they use all kinds of things to explain that away. But in the end, each man knows in his heart of hearts that he is accountable to his God, to his Creator, for the way that he is to live. Now, Isaiah, after reflecting on this coming of the servant of the Lord and what he would do for us, calls upon the church to sing to the Lord a new song. Now you might, if you fully appreciate all that Isaiah has had to say so far, you might wonder why is it that Isaiah has to actually exhort us or command us to sing? Because really that ought to be the natural response. There ought to be a celebration for what God has done for us in Jesus. Jesus. 